Yeah, the appreciator's here. And uh, it's a do not miss the big appreciator, the big appreciation showcase, rather. Number seven, because it's just, uh, it's totally awesome. And it has a really good 2017 episode of the Overnight Scape with Frank Edward Nora, among other treats. Um, you get to hear uh, this, a show from 1941 with Groucho Marx and the uh, faded matinee idol John Barrymore, a Rudy Valley show. Um, it, it's just really, really good stuff. Check it out. More good stuff there than you can possibly imagine. And of course, the uh, always lovable Vic and Sade. Um, it, it, with with the stem bottoms, how can you go wrong? Um, it's enjoy and definitely do not miss it. Don't uh, just put it on. It's night radio. Yes, it's about four or five hours, but it's four or five hours that you can put on, do your things, and have it just kind of percolate in the back of your mind, or perhaps you have insomnia, and you just need that night feeling and. More and more, I am going into and finding early public domain music. Yeah, up to 1924 is literally fair game. And why not take advantage of that? And I'm realizing more and more, yes, I do touch on modern things, modern films. But I am seeing this all from this nostalgist's viewpoint. So I think it's official. The, uh, the appreciator and the big appreciation probably should be classified as nostalgia, which is also a staple of classic old-time night radio. Um, I had to do a little bit more research to see what happens in the middle of the night on radio, but New Mexico is notorious for having really weak few stations and very little and i don't know i haven't scanned am in so long and indeed on the internet almost all night radio streams somewhere but that i don't know i i think it's a matter of the commercials that get to me because the old commercials have a certain charm to them but modern commercials i mean commercials for the most ridiculous pharmaceuticals and, and that scene and and i don't know however let let's proceed here on this appreciation i've been reading from marcus aurelius's meditations because this book no matter how you look at it it's these nice little bits and it's sort of things to think about that are good advice like uh this from book three uh Section 12. These little uh, paragraphs are considered sections somehow. But uh, this one says, If you set yourself to your present task along the path of true reason, with all determination, vigor, and goodwill, if you admit no distraction, but keep your own divinity pure and standing strong, as if you had to surrender it right now, if you grapple this to you, expecting nothing, shirking nothing but self-content with each present action taken in accordance with nature and a heroic truthfulness in all that you say and mean, then you will lead a good life, and nobody is able to stop you. I found, you know, to just examining myself, yes, uh, I mean, it's okay when Gene Shepard exaggerates stretches the truth a little, characterizes things maybe to make himself look a little better or a little worse. But when you are dealing with other people, really being straightforward, a straight shooter and honest, and not so much being concerned with... I know you don't want to be mean or cruel if you have to criticize something, but saying you like something that you don't particularly like is extremely disingenuous and it eventually could turn into poison. So 
that's one of the lessons out of that. Um, and just like this upcoming Overnight Scape Central, which I think I, re yeah, I record that tomorrow evening on Focus. I am perennially distractible. It just the slightest thing on the periphery that uh, if the conversation isn't quite going my way that I can grab onto and take the conversation in the direction that my will and my brain would like to. I can jump, and I think that's why I feel sometimes on the exit ramp when we're all talking and a topic has come up that I just leap in, sometimes almost interrupting, but I, I wait for the slightest opening and I am ready to just jump in and yes, perhaps peripherally refer to the topic at hand, but just to take it in this digressive way to something that I feel I can express myself or I have a story about. And perhaps that's entertaining. I'm not sure. But is it fair to my fellow speakers in any given you know, group talk on the ONSUG or in real life? Um, I really feel I need to focus on what's going on better and listen more. Uh, I find that I can listen to things as second time shows and there are things that I completely missed. And yes, the human mind, after a conversation, they've done surveys and you only remember some 40% to 60% of what was actually said. And I don't know. I would rather spend less time lost in my own head and get to know the people that I'm taking the time to be with and allegedly listen to. So, so this Aurelius is very good advice, and uh, I would like to do more of that. I, I, that's really an important thing. And speaking of digressing, I was recently... I mean, I, I watch a lot of like comic review and comic focused things still and listen to the podcasts on YouTube. I mean, I have cut way down and I'm certainly much more avoiding these um, really biased, strong, going after the other side political things that used to be just so I felt I was being informed, but really... I think I was just being, having my fuse relit and distracted from, well, like distracted from the important things. Like, I've been talking about comic book art and comic book artists. And there's one, and I've talked about him before, Rob Leefield. Now, Rob Leefield, I mean, he just had a couple of years where he messed around. He got to Marvel and he started doing X-Men books. And his style, yes, the anatomy is terrible. It's style, not substance, but cheapers. To my eye, at least, the eye appeal of Rob Leefield's early work. Yeah, the, 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 nobody on earth has ankles that thin. But the hatching he used, the pen work, the design, there is something so appealing to my eyes I mean, much like if somebody looks analytically at my great hero and the hero of Marvel Comics and possibly all comics, because even his um, stint at DC, the competitor of Marvel, you know, the ones that make Superman and Batman, look at it this way. Superman, Batman, Flash, that's DC, Justice League, Spider-Man, Captain America, the Avengers, Hulk, that's Marvel. But Jack Kirby actually had a huge influence and worked for both companies. Um, and a lot of what DC does to this very day is more based on Kirby concepts than most people realize. But uh, uh, back to Kirby's style, if you look at it from a strict anatomical viewpoint, no, it doesn't work. People are not and were never built like that. But again... It has this action and frisson, and no, Rob Leefield doesn't have that. Rob Leefield just has this incredible 
appealing design to my eyes. And if, if you look around and search uh, images, uh, I think you'll see what I mean. And because he was criticized so much over the last 10 years, I think he like schooled himself to draw more realistically. And it looks okay, but it doesn't have that excitement anymore. If I were going to buy an original Rob Leefield piece, which that's ridiculous, I couldn't afford that in a million years. Comic book art used to be this like side thing. I remember buying Gil Kane pages, and Gil Kane now, he's passed on. I mean, he was an originator of the Silver Age Green Lantern. Uh, Adam Warlock, who appeared in the Guardians of the Galaxy. That whole saga with the high evolutionary that uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy movie takes a lot from, a lot of that was drawn by Gil Kane. And that's when I first learned to appreciate his artwork. He had a fine sense of anatomy, unlike many, but his style and his pen work and the dynamics of it. Um, you used to be able to buy his pages, even his Warlock pages, at $20, $30 at a show. And yeah, in the 70s, 80s, $20, $30 was a little less. But nowadays... I don't think you can buy a Gil Kane page for less than several hundred dollars. Um, Jack Kirby pages, as I said, they're in the thousands, period. I mean, his most throwaway, toss-away, mediocre, no heroes, just nonsense page is in the thousands of dollars. Um, Rob Leefield, I believe his art goes for a lot of money, and... There's an artfulness to it that I can't stress how much I like. Let's uh, just to break things up. I think I've got some Bob and Ray. How about some Bob and Ray? And now come with us as we travel once again to Garish Summit, with its endless tales of intrigue among the socially prominent. There, in stately splendor, far removed from the squalid village below, they fight their petty battles over power and money. As our story resumes, young Caldwell Merchfield has just returned to work at the family business after being cleared of a crime that he actually committed. He pauses in the reception room to chat with his spineless brother, Rodney. I just want to tell you that it's great to be back at work, Rodney. I also want to tell you that uh, I'll be at the country club for the rest of the day. I'd uh, like to speak to you for a moment before you go, Caldwell. Okay, but be quick about it. I'm scheduled to tee off at noon, and it's almost 9.30 now. Well, I assure you this won't take long. I just want to say that my proposal of marriage has been accepted by my ravishingly beautiful secretary, Pamela. We'll announce our engagement at the club dance on Saturday night. Gee, your timing may be bad on that, Rodney. I plan to ask Pamela to go with me to the dance. And it might be embarrassing for you to announce your engagement when she's there on a date with another guy. Caldwell, I hope you'll see the wisdom of giving up your foolish pursuit of Pamela now that she's agreed to marry me. Gosh, you never want me to have any fun at all, do you? I really don't care about your frivolous lifestyle. But your attempts to date Pamela are unthinkable. After all, I'm obligated to ask you to be best man at our wedding. Well, I don't know how much of a job like that pays, but I've got a hunch that uh, the wedding will never come off. Has Mother heard that you plan to marry some floozy with no social connections? I've only mentioned it to her briefly on the phone, but I know she'll be thrilled once we start making all the formal plans. Hey, uh, Wilfred, why is Miss Agatha up there on the roof, barely hanging out of the weather vane with one hand? I believe she's a trifle upset that Master Rodney plans to marry a woman who's beneath his station, Lloyd. You tell him to call it off right now, or he can come home and pick me up with an eyedropper. Please reconsider, Miss Agatha. All of us servants still love you. How could any woman be beneath Rodney's station? He's a wimp. And everybody else around here lives in Fruitcake City. How can you be so insensitive, Lloyd? 
Miss Agatha is in peril. Get my her. attorney, Bowden Padu, on the phone, Wilfred. Tell him to handle this matter, or I jump. Very well, ma'am. I'm dialing his number right now. <laughs> Well, uh, forgive my intrusion, Mr. Pardew, but uh, I have a proposition that can make you a millionaire many times over. I'll try to hold that thought for a moment while I take this call on my private line. Hello? Yes, Wilfred. Well, inform Agatha that I'm busy with a client just now. No, I'm not concerned. As I remember, there's plenty of shrubbery to cushion or fall directly under the weather vane. Yes. I'll get back to you shortly, tomorrow at the latest. Goodbye. Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Uh... Pelkington. Jarvis Pelkington, Jr., board chairman of the Pelkington Anchor and Buckshot Cartel. That's astounding. Your firm is the hated competitor of the Merchfield Lead Company. The Pelkingtons and the Merchfields have been trying to destroy each other for 50 years. Quite true, sir. But the end of that long battle is now in sight. You see, Rodney Merchfield's intended bride is merely posing as a simple typist. In reality, she's my dear sister, the accomplished industrial spy, Pamela Pelkington. Good gravy. Well spoken, Mr. Pardue. Now you just uh, keep that as our little secret while you convince Agatha that the wedding should take place. And once the marriage enables Pottington to absorb Merchfield lead, you'll be handsomely paid for your services. Quite handsomely paid, indeed. <laughs> Can Jarvis Pelkington persuade Bowden Pardew to use his influence on Agatha? Can Rodney persuade Caldwell to end his social relationship with Pamela? And what about Wilfred's failure to persuade Bowden Pardew to persuade Agatha not to jump. Join us next time when we'll hear Lloyd, the gardener, say, Well, I don't know why he thought the shrubbery would break or fall. I transplanted those bushes last spring. That's in our next exciting visit to Garish Summit. Much of it out there. And is it there another... Really funny and unique act, so to speak. I guess that's what you'd call them, a team. Remember the days of comedy teams? I mean, the last one that I can recall that really was successful was Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. But are, are there still, am, am I missing something? Are there still, I, I believe we had Laurel and Hardy at growing up. And those... Their later films, no, but the two reelers, the 20 minute long ones they made for the Hal Roach Studios in the 30s, those are just fabulous. And uh, if you get the opportunity to see them, I'm sure they're on YouTube. They have to be somewhere online. Although, I don't know. It, it really is becoming more and more difficult to see these, to see anything old. If you can see me but I'm not quite as old as Laurel and Hardy or any of these things. And I suppose they were kind of old even when I was young. But it's it, like Frank Norris says, in that day, we had such limited viewing and what was on the several channels on TV were pretty much what we were exposed to. So everybody was a little more familiar with the old stuff because that's what was on. I knew movies on TV was an innovation. I was already in my teens, pretty much. And then, you know, they'd show some really cut-up version on Monday night at the movies. And people who had cable, which where I lived, cable was not possible until I was almost out of high school. And boy, when I first got cable, that was just, wow. Wow, 20 channels. And if you spent a little more, you got home box office now it's like all these streaming channels and more stuff and even then we get jaded it's just like when vhs came out and we had these huge video stores with just so many movies at first and then you go there for a few months or a year and it's like instead of 
being eager and having this big want list, you get pickier and pickier. There's something about human nature that I haven't yet quite figured out. But no matter what glut of material might be available, we just become choosy based on, at least I do, is there somebody who can go to the same video store that has... Well, there aren't video. Are there video stores anymore? I don't think so. Oh, and congratulations are in order to Bob Lament. He won a golden micro, an award. That there are awards being given to, like just regular podcasters, not the Joe Rogans and the big big guys. Uh, I don't know. I. I do this, I mean, to God, if I were winning an award, that, that then just watch out my already uh, warped. That, that I have the biggest ego and the lowest self-esteem at the same time. It's really remarkable because I know in my heart what I'm doing is just so totally self-indulgent. Uh, and if somebody gives me a hook that allows me to indulge myself, as Frank Nora has for years, and those, I mean, Jimbo, Jimbo was really, I mean, it was really nice having somebody who thought most of what I did was the greatest thing in the world. But let's face it, even you might be humoring me a little more than I deserve at being the appreciator, so to speak. However, if for some reason you have missed out on me uh, promoting and, and recommending Static Radio is his podcast. Uh, Static Radio, Bob Lament. They have the Static Radio channel on YouTube, but the problem with finding it's tricky to find them because radio and static are some sort of search terms that are common. Um, uh, but I'm subscribed, so every time they come out with a new show, which is every week, him and his friend Miles Title as I've told you, do that they have this ongoing conversation that's been going on since the early 2000s. He was one of the pioneers of podcasting, did internet radio before the term podcast was even coined, and they keep it up week after week. Um, and oddly, I mean, you would think that they're all archived, but I believe some of the earliest episodes because back in the day, you couldn't, affording to archive space was so much in those years. These, you know, hard drives got lost. And he also did a show called Morning Commute for a long time on the Overnight Scape Underground, which I always recommended, O-N-S-U-G dot com. And there are a bunch of them uh, archived on archive.org as well so you have all of that to uh, chew on and enjoy and 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 appreciate because that's we're, we're promoting things that sound like night radio the way i remember it anyways i mean we all have a different idea of what was what is night radio I, to some people it's just kind of heart bell um or Larry King. Remember Larry King? He'd have guests. And some of, I mean, yes, towards the end, he had some pretty famous people. But when he was doing his all-night show, which to me was his glory days, yes, he probably got paid a lot more later in his career when he was interviewing celebrities on CNN. But the, to me, that really wasn't the quintessential old-school Larry King who would interview almost any author, anybody who was looking to talk and be promoted or be interviewed on the radio. And, and Larry was good. He was just a master of that night radio and the interviewing part of that. Um, one of the best, if not the best. And speaking of old media that has dated, even for me, I was for the longest time especially in the early days of VHS, because finally these were made available, because they were already too old and too unpopular to be shown on television. So 
I started with Chaplin and Keaton, the silent films, with the comedians first, and then discovering different actors and actresses and directors. I mean, a director like Eric von Stroheim, who is known as the man you love to hate. And you can find documentaries on him on YouTube. He was this extravagant, overdrawn character that today probably just couldn't function. I He made money, so Hollywood would keep giving him these opportunities to make films, and he would do these crazy, self-indulgent things like building a set. That He made the first movie. I mean, movies used to cost maybe $100,000 for a big production. Not for Eric von Stroheim. When he made a movie called Foolish Wives, that was considered the first million-dollar movie. I mean... He rebuilt a whole part of Monte Carlo on a back lot in Hollywood, which, you know, today we do some indulgent things. And even today, now they don't build sets. They just stick people on a green screen and the sets are done by these masters of digital art. But von Stroheim had these enormous crews. I mean, like D.W. Griffith did with things like Intolerance. And you don't know who D.W. Griffith is. The father of the feature film. I mean, there's a whole history of cinema that even when they do histories of movies, say it's 10 parts, like the first part, like really quick, they go over the silent era and a few stars like Chaplin and even Chaplin's being forgotten. I mean, do you know who Charlie Chaplin is? Have you actually watched a Charlie Chaplin movie? And if you have, have you watched a Charlie Chaplin film in the last 20 years? There is a whole segment of popular culture that to me is just so important and so wonderful and so, and even I can't watch it, is what I was leading up to. I mean, I had at one point until recently downloaded this whole selection of great silent films that you know, so I'm going to watch them. Oh, yes, I'm going to watch them. Oh, and then I'd wind up doing other stuff, watching eight-minute-long YouTubes, watching a modern movie, um, listening to podcasts. I haven't myself watched a feature silent film, I would bet, in 10 years. And I used to go, I mean, before you could get them on VHS, I would go and make trips to go see these films presented and now it's just a form of jadedness i mean that could really be what it is and the attention span you you can't it, it's a different kind of attention when you're paying attention to a silent film especially if you're watching it at home in a theater you have the captivation the dark and you're there and what's on the screen, if you have the patience for it, you watch. But at home, I am so ultimately distractible. I mean, if I'm watching a modern film, I might daydream a little, doodle, uh, just kind of look around the room. I am very rarely, for the two hours that it takes to watch a movie, just staring, focused, at a film but that's and that's a fact but uh next time we get together i am going to uh go over some directors not silent i mean i mentioned a couple of people and if you want to follow that up or if you want to encourage me to get all nostalgic with different silent film directors but obscure artsy films and film directors i think is what I am going to shoot for in what the 33rd episode upcoming of The Appreciator, right here, wherever you heard this, the Overnight Scape Underground, perhaps YouTube, although I am really considering suspending taking the time to post on YouTube. It's just, it, it, I like the Overnight Scape Underground, and if I find someplace else that 
feels good. YouTube just feels like I'm tossing it into the ocean and it just drifts away into nowhere. What have you. Uh, I appreciate you listening and I will catch up with you guys the next time. And until then, set the controls for the heart of the fun. And uh, yeah, I'll keep digressing. <laughs>